My name is Ellie. I'm a social worker, the kind who believes in second chances, in the power of redemption. Ironic, isn't it? Given what I'm about to do, my life, until recently, was a carefully constructed tableau of suburban bliss. Loving husband, beautiful home, fulfilling career, a gilded cage, really. And the key holder? My mother-in-law, Judith. Surprise. David grinned, pulling me into the opulent dining room. Crystal chandeliers glittered, casting rainbows across the polished mahogany table set for a feast. Judith, impeccably dressed in a designer gown, raised her champagne flute. We're so thrilled, darling. David tells me you're finally seeing sense about family. My stomach lurched. Family. The word tasted like ash in my mouth. I hadn't told anyone I was pregnant, let alone considering terminating it. David squeezed my hand, oblivious to the silent scream building in my throat. Isn't this wonderful, Ellie? Mother's throwing us a celebration. I forced a smile, my fingers curling around the stem of the champagne flute. It's to surprise. I managed, my voice a strained whisper. Judith's hawk-like gaze settled on my face, a triumphant glint in her eyes. Oh, don't be coy, dear. We all know what this is about. It's about time you embraced your role, your duty. My role, my duty, Judith's favorite words. According to her, my sole purpose in life was to produce an heir for the Vance dynasty. Never mind my career, my aspirations. Those were frivolous pursuits, easily discarded in the face of family obligation. David, bless his oblivious heart, was beaming. He'd always wanted children, a whole brood of them, filling our perfectly manicured lawn with the echoes of laughter. He'd never understand my hesitation, the fear that motherhood would swallow me whole, transforming me into a pale imitation of Judith, obsessed with social status and lineage. Mother insisted on celebrating, David said, his voice laced with pride. He nudged me playfully. She's already planning the nursery. Italian marble, hand-painted murals. My smile tightened. Judith was already decorating a nursery for a child that might not even exist. A wave of nausea washed over me, and I excused myself, rushing to the powder room. I stared at my reflection, the woman staring back a stranger. Pale, wide-eyed, trapped. I splashed cold water on my face, trying to regain my composure. I had to get out of there, away from the suffocating expectations, the veiled threats disguised as well wishes. I returned to the dining room, plastering a smile back on my face. I'm so sorry, I said, feigning a sudden headache. I'm not feeling well. I think I need some fresh air. Judith's smile faltered, her eyes narrowing. Nonsense, dear. You can't leave now. We haven't even had dessert yet. I really must, I insisted, my voice trembling slightly. I'll be fine. Just a bit overwhelmed. That's all. I glanced at David, hoping he'd understand, intervene. He frowned, concern etched on his face. Are you sure, Ellie? You look a bit pale. I'm sure, I said, grabbing my purse. I'll see you later. Before anyone could protest, I turned and fled, the weight of Judith's expectations pressing down on me like a physical burden. As I stepped out into the cool night air, I knew this was just the beginning. The first crack in the foundation of my gilded cage. And I had a feeling it wouldn't be long before the whole thing came crashing down. The following morning, the tension from the previous night lingered like a stale perfume. David, ever the peacemaker, tried to bridge the chasm that had opened between his mother and me. Ellie mother's just excited, he said, his voice gentle. She wants what's best for us. What's best for us? I repeated, the bitterness seeping into my words. Or what's best for the Vance family legacy? He sighed, running a hand through his hair. Don't be like that. She just wants to be involved. Involved? She's trying to orchestrate our lives. I countered, the memory of Judith's triumphant smirk flashing before my eyes. She announced my pregnancy to the world before I even had a chance to process it myself. David looked conflicted, torn between loyalty to his mother and understanding for my feelings. She got carried away, that's all. She means well. I know you believe that, David, I said softly, 
but sometimes good intentions pave the road to hell. Later that day, my younger sister, Olivia, arrived unannounced, her vibrant energy a stark contrast to the oppressive atmosphere of the Vance mansion. Olivia, a free-spirited artist, was my confidant, the one person who truly understood me. So, spill, she demanded, her eyes sparkling with curiosity. What's the deal with the cryptic phone call? Emergency family summit. Sounds ominous. I poured her a glass of wine, my hands still trembling slightly. I'm pregnant, I whispered, the words heavy with unspoken anxieties. Olivia's face lit up. Ellie, that's amazing. Congratulations. Her enthusiasm felt jarring, a discordant note in the symphony of my unease. It's complicated, I said, the joy of the news overshadowed by Judith's manipulative machinations. Complicated how? Olivia asked, her brow furrowing with concern. I recounted the events of the previous night, Judith's announcement, the suffocating pressure, my own ambivalence about motherhood. Olivia listened intently, her usual carefree demeanor replaced by a thoughtful frown. Judith's always been a piece of work, she said finally, her voice laced with indignation. But this is a new low, even for her. Her validation was a balm to my raw nerves. I feel like I'm losing my mind, Liv. She's making me question everything. Don't let her get to you, Ellie, Olivia said, her voice firm. You're strong, you're capable. Don't let her steal your joy. Over the next few days, Judith's manipulation became more insidious. She dropped seemingly innocent comments about my age, my biological clock, the risks of delaying motherhood. She'd send me articles about the joys of parenting, the fulfillment of raising a family, the emptiness of a childless life. You'll make a wonderful mother, dear, she'd say, her voice dripping with false sweetness. Of course, it's a demanding role. Perhaps you'll need to reconsider your career. Children need their mothers, especially in the early years. Each word, each gesture, was a carefully aimed dart designed to erode my confidence, to make me doubt my own judgment. I found myself withdrawing, isolating myself from David, from Olivia, from the world. I felt like a puppet, my strings being pulled by an unseen hand. One evening, Judith invited me for a girl's night, a rare occurrence that set my teeth on edge. We need to bond, dear, she said, her smile brittle. Mother and daughter. I reluctantly agreed, sensing a trap, but unable to refuse without arousing suspicion. We went to a trendy new restaurant, the air thick with the scent of expensive perfume and simmering resentment. Judith ordered a bottle of vintage champagne, her eyes glittering with an unsettling intensity. I know you have reservations about motherhood, Ellie, she began, her voice deceptively soft. But I assure you, it's the most rewarding experience a woman can have. She took a sip of champagne, her gaze fixed on mine. You'll understand once you hold your own child in your arms. All your doubts, all your fears, will melt away. I stared at her, a knot of unease tightening in my stomach. There was something in her eyes, a predatory gleam that sent a chill down my spine. I realized then that this wasn't about family, about legacy. This was about control. Judith wanted to own me, to mold me into her image, to erase the independent, ambitious woman I was and replace her with a docile, obedient mother. And I had a sinking feeling that she would stop at nothing to achieve her goal. The relaxing spa weekend Judith orchestrated arrived like a poison chalice. I felt a growing unease, a premonition of something lurking beneath the surface of her forced generosity. The spa, nestled in the secluded mountains, was exclusive, opulent, and eerily quiet. Judith, citing a prior engagement, hadn't come, which only amplified my anxiety. Just what you need, darling, she'd said, her hand resting a little too firmly on my arm. A chance to unwind, to prepare for motherhood. Her smile didn't reach her eyes. The first day passed in a blur of massages, facials, and herbal teas. I tried to relax, to push the gnawing suspicion to the back of my mind, but a persistent sense of unease lingered. That night, after a light dinner, I returned to my luxurious suite. A small aromatherapy diffuser, 
a gift from the spa, sat on the bedside table. A handwritten note from Judith accompanied it. Sweet dreams, darling. This blend is specifically designed for expectant mothers. Enjoy. The scent, a cloying mix of floral and herbal notes, filled the room. I felt a sudden wave of dizziness, followed by a sharp, stabbing pain in my abdomen. I doubled over, clutching my stomach, the room spinning around me. I tried to reach for the phone, but darkness closed in, swallowing me whole. I woke up in a sterile hospital room, the harsh fluorescent lights assaulting my eyes. A nurse hovered over me, her face etched with concern. Mrs. Vance, you've had a miscarriage. I'm so sorry. The words hit me like a physical blow, knocking the air from my lungs. Miscarriage. The baby was gone. A hollow ache settled in my chest, a gaping void where hope had once bloomed. David arrived soon after, his face pale and drawn. He held my hand, his touch cold, his eyes filled with a grief that mirrored my own. In the days that followed, Judith's solicitous concern felt like a suffocating shroud. She hovered over me, murmuring platitudes about God's will and time healing all wounds. Her presence, once a source of irritation, now felt like a physical threat. I started to see her differently, her mask of maternal concern slipping, revealing the cold, calculating woman beneath. It's just so tragic, she'd say, her voice laced with a strange mix of sorrow and satisfaction. But you're young, dear. You can try again. Try again. As if a child were a replaceable commodity, an accessory to be acquired and discarded. My grief was a raw, open wound, and Judith's constant presence felt like salt being poured into it. I began to question everything. The aromatherapy diffuser, the sudden dizziness, the excruciating pain. Was it just a tragic accident, or was there something more sinister at play? David, consumed by his own grief, remained oblivious to my growing suspicion. He attributed my erratic behavior to the trauma of the miscarriage, the emotional roller coaster of loss. You need to rest, Ellie, he'd say, his voice filled with concern. You're not yourself, but I was myself. For the first time, I was seeing clearly the scales falling from my eyes. I saw Judith for who she truly was, a master manipulator, pulling the strings from behind the scenes, orchestrating events to suit her own twisted agenda. And I knew, with a chilling certainty, that my miscarriage was no accident. One afternoon, while David was at work, I decided to investigate. I drove back to the spa, my heart pounding in my chest. I spoke to the spa manager, feigning interest in booking another stay. I casually inquired about the aromatherapy diffusers, the specific blend Judith had gifted me. The manager frowned, her brow furrowing. We don't offer personalized blends, madam, she said, a flicker of confusion in her eyes. All our diffusers contain the same standard blend of lavender and chamomile. My blood ran cold. Judith had lied. The diffuser she'd given me wasn't a harmless gift. It was a weapon. I left the spa, my mind racing, the pieces of the puzzle starting to fall into place. I remembered Judith's personal assistant, Ethan, a quiet, unassuming man who always seemed to be lurking in the shadows. He'd been at the spa that weekend, ostensibly to assist Judith with some errands. But now, I suspected his role was far more sinister. The world tilted on its axis. The spa's confirmation that they didn't offer personalized blends was the crack in the dam, releasing a torrent of suspicion. Judith's gift wasn't a thoughtful gesture. It was a calculated act. But why? What possible motive could she have for wanting me to lose the baby? The answer, chilling in its simplicity, whispered in the darkest corners of my mind. Control. I began to observe Judith with a new, hypervigilant awareness. Every word, every gesture, every seemingly innocent comment now held a hidden meaning. Her solicitous concern felt suffocating, her touch repulsive. I saw the subtle manipulations, the veiled threats disguised as gentle advice. She was a spider, weaving a web of deceit, and I was caught in its sticky embrace. You're still grieving, dear, she'd say, her voice dripping with false sympathy. It's perfectly normal to feel unstable. 
perhaps you should see a therapist. It's important to address these emotional imbalances. Her words, meant to soothe, felt like tiny needles pricking at my sanity. She was gaslighting me, making me question my own perceptions, my own reality. Was I overreacting? Was I imagining things? Was my grief warping my judgment? The doubts, fueled by Judith's subtle manipulations, gnawed at me, eroding my confidence, my sense of self. I confided in David, hoping for support, for validation. But he, blinded by his own grief and his unwavering faith in his mother, dismissed my concerns. Ellie, you're being paranoid, he said gently, his voice laced with concern. Mother would never do anything to hurt you. She's just worried about you. His words, meant to comfort, felt like a betrayal. He couldn't see what I saw, couldn't grasp the insidious nature of Judith's manipulation. He was trapped in his own gilded cage, blinded by loyalty and love. My isolation deepened. I felt like I was screaming into a void, my voice lost in the echoes of Judith's carefully constructed narrative. She had painted me as unstable, as emotionally fragile, and David, along with the rest of the family, was buying into her lies. Desperate for an ally, I turned to Olivia. I told her about the aromatherapy diffuser, about Judith's lie, about my growing suspicion. To my dismay, Olivia's reaction wasn't the unwavering support I'd hoped for. She hesitated, her brow furrowed with doubt. Are you sure about this, Ellie? She asked, her voice tinged with uncertainty. It sounds far-fetched. Judith can be difficult, yes, but I can't imagine her doing something like that. My heart sank. Even Olivia, my confidant, my sister, was doubting me. Judith's poison had seeped into every corner of my life, tainting even the closest of my relationships. I know it sounds crazy, I pleaded, my voice trembling with desperation. But I know what I felt, what I saw. Something's not right, Liv. You have to believe me. Olivia looked conflicted, torn between loyalty to me and the ingrained belief in Judith's inherent goodness. I want to believe you, Ellie, she said finally, her voice soft. But you've been through so much. Maybe you need some time to heal, to process everything. Her words, meant to be kind, felt like a dismissal. I realized then that I was truly alone in this fight. I couldn't rely on David, on Olivia, on anyone. I had to uncover the truth myself. Driven by a desperate need for answers, I started digging. I researched aromatherapy, focusing on essential oils that could induce miscarriage. I contacted the spa again, this time posing as a journalist investigating alternative therapies. I learned that certain oils, when used in high concentrations, could indeed be harmful, even dangerous. Then, I remembered Ethan, Judith's ever-present assistant. He'd been at the spa that weekend. He'd been the one who delivered the diffuser to my room. I started researching him, delving into his background, his connections. And that's when I found it. A small, seemingly insignificant detail that shattered the remaining fragments of my naivete. Ethan had a background in pharmacology. He wasn't just a harmless assistant. He was Judith's weapon. The revelation of Ethan's pharmacology background was a chilling confirmation of my suspicions. He wasn't just a harmless assistant. He was Judith's instrument, her means of enacting her twisted schemes. The pieces of the puzzle clicked into place, forming a horrifying picture. Judith, desperate for a Vance air, had orchestrated my miscarriage, using Ethan's knowledge to tamper with the aromatherapy diffuser. The realization hit me with the force of a physical blow, leaving me breathless, trembling with a mixture of grief, rage, and a chilling sense of purpose. My paranoia intensified, morphing into a hypervigilance that bordered on obsession. I saw Judith's machinations everywhere, in every conversation, every gesture. The world became a minefield of hidden meanings, veiled threats, and subtle manipulations. I withdrew further into myself, isolating myself from David, from Olivia, from everyone who might inadvertently betray me to Judith. David, increasingly concerned by my erratic behavior, attributed it to the lingering trauma of the miscarriage. Ellie, you need help, he'd say, his voice filled with a mixture of love and exasperation. 
You're not well. You need to see a therapist. His words, meant to express concern, felt like accusations. He couldn't see, wouldn't see, the truth. He was trapped in Judith's web of deceit, blinded by his loyalty to his mother. One evening, while rummaging through some old boxes in the attic, I stumbled upon a stack of Olivia's artwork. Beautiful, vibrant paintings that showcased her unique talent. Tucked amongst the canvases, I found a series of bank statements addressed to Olivia, with substantial deposits from an unknown source. My heart pounded in my chest as I examined the statements more closely. The account number was linked to a shell corporation owned by Judith. The truth hit me like a tidal wave. Judith wasn't just manipulating me, she was manipulating Olivia as well. She was funding Olivia's art career, using her financial dependence as leverage to gain information about me, to control my sister, to turn her into an unwitting pawn in her twisted game. I confronted Olivia. The bank statements spread out on the table between us. Her initial reaction was denial, then confusion, then a dawning horror as the realization of Judith's betrayal washed over her. I, I didn't know, she stammered, her voice trembling. She said it was a gift, an investment in my talent. She used to live, I said, my voice laced with anger and sorrow. She used you against me. Olivia's face crumpled, tears streaming down her cheeks. I'm so sorry, Ellie, she whispered, her voice choked with emotion. I didn't know. I swear I didn't know. In that moment, the last vestiges of my isolation shattered. I had an ally, a co-conspirator in my fight against Judith. Olivia, heartbroken and enraged by Judith's betrayal, vowed to help me expose her, to bring her down. Together, we began to gather evidence, piecing together the intricate web of Judith's lies and manipulations. We uncovered emails, text messages, and financial records that exposed the extent of her machinations, the depth of her depravity. We discovered that Judith had been systematically undermining my relationship with David, planting seeds of doubt about my sanity, my fitness as a wife and mother. The weight of Judith's betrayal was crushing, but it also fueled a burning desire for revenge. The grief over my lost child transformed into a cold, hard rage, a determination to make Judith pay for what she'd done. I would dismantle her carefully constructed world, brick by gilded brick. I would expose her lies, shatter her facade, and reclaim my life. The gilded cage had held me captive for too long. It was time to break free. The annual Vance Family Christmas Gala was the perfect stage for my unveiling. The mansion buzzed with guests, oblivious to the storm brewing beneath the surface of polite conversation and forced smiles. Judith, resplendent in a crimson gown, held court, the queen of her meticulously crafted kingdom. David, ever the dutiful son, played the role of the charming prince, oblivious to the rot festering at the heart of his family. Olivia and I, dressed in simple black dresses, moved through the crowd like shadows, our eyes meeting occasionally, a silent understanding passing between us. We were the ghosts at the feast, the harbingers of truth, ready to shatter the illusion of perfection. My plan was simple, yet devastatingly effective. I'd subtly planted the evidence of Judith's financial manipulation of Olivia amongst the auction items, a seemingly innocuous piece of artwork accompanied by a detailed provenance that traced the funding back to Judith's Shell Corporation. The revelation, time to coincide with my own expose, would serve as a double blow, exposing not only Judith's cruelty towards me, but also her manipulation of Olivia. As the evening progressed, I felt a strange sense of calm descend upon me. The fear, the anxiety, the crippling self-doubt that had plagued me for so long had vanished, replaced by a steely resolve. This wasn't just about revenge, it was about justice, about reclaiming my voice, my power. The moment arrived. The auctioneer, a flamboyant man with a booming voice, presented the final item, a striking sculpture by Olivia. This exquisite piece, he announced, his voice echoing through the ballroom, comes with a fascinating history. The artist, a rising star in the art world, was generously funded by a mysterious benefactor. He paused for dramatic effect, holding up a framed document. 
And tonight, we reveal the identity of this generous patron. A hush fell over the room. The auctioneer dramatically unveiled the document, a blown-up copy of the bank statements linking Olivia's funding to Judith's Shell Corporation. Murmurs rippled through the crowd, whispers turning into gasps of disbelief. Judith's carefully crafted facade began to crack. Before the shock could fully register, I stepped forward, my voice clear and steady. I believe I can shed some light on Judith's generosity, I said, my eyes fixed on Judith's stunned face. I held up a small, unassuming object, the tampered aromatherapy diffuser from the spa. This, I said, my voice rising, is the reason I lost my child. This is the weapon Judith used to destroy my happiness, to control my life. The room erupted in chaos. Gasps, shouts, and whispers collided in a cacophony of disbelief and outrage. Judith, her face drained of color, stared at me, her eyes wide with a mixture of fear and fury. You're lying, she hissed, her voice barely a whisper. You're crazy, am I? I challenged, my voice ringing with conviction. Perhaps you should ask Ethan about the specific blend of essential oils he used to tamper with this diffuser. Oils known to induce miscarriage. I turned my gaze to Ethan, who stood frozen in the corner, his face ashen. He opened his mouth to speak, but no words came out. His silence was a deafening confession. David, his face a mask of shock and confusion, stared at his mother, then at me, his eyes darting back and forth as if trying to make sense of the unfolding drama. The truth, brutal and undeniable, was finally breaking through his carefully constructed illusion. Mother, he said, his voice trembling. Is this true? Judith, cornered and exposed, lashed out, her voice laced with desperation. She's lying. She's trying to destroy us. Don't believe her. But the damage was done. The seeds of doubt had been planted, and the truth, like a relentless weed, was beginning to take root. The gilded cage, once a symbol of wealth and privilege, was now a prison, its bars closing in on Judith, trapping her in the web of her own deceit. The reign of the queen was over. The fallout from the Christmas gala was swift and brutal. The whispers, once hushed and speculative, now echoed through the halls of the Vance mansion, amplified by the shocked murmurs of the social elite. Judith's carefully constructed facade crumbled, revealing the cold, calculating woman beneath. Her reputation, once her most prized possession, lay in tatters, stained by the undeniable evidence of her cruelty and deceit. David, reeling from the revelation of his mother's betrayal, confronted her in the aftermath of the gala. The confrontation, held in the once opulent, now suffocating drawing room, was raw and visceral. Why, mother, he demanded, his voice thick with pain and disbelief. Why would you do this to Ellie? To us. Judith, stripped of her usual composure, resorted to her well-worn tactics, her voice laced with feigned innocence and wounded pride. She's lying, David, she insisted, her eyes flashing with anger. She's manipulating you, turning you against me. The evidence is clear, mother, David countered, his voice shaking with suppressed rage. The bank statements, Ethan's confession. You can't deny it any longer. Judith's composure finally cracked. I did it for you, David, she cried, her voice rising hysterically. For the family. She wasn't fit to bear a Van Sayre. She was going to throw it all away, your legacy, our future. My legacy? David repeated, his voice laced with disgust. You call this a legacy? Lies, manipulation, and cruelty. He turned away from her, his shoulders slumped with the weight of his disillusionment. The son who had once idolized his mother now saw her for who she truly was, a woman driven by ambition and a twisted sense of entitlement. Olivia, emboldened by the truth, finally confronted Judith as well. The confrontation, unlike David's anguished questioning, was filled with a righteous fury. You used me, Olivia spat, her voice trembling with rage. You pretended to support my art when all you wanted was to control me, to use me against my own sister. Judith, backed into a corner, offered no defense, 
her silence a tacit admission of guilt. The carefully constructed walls she had built around herself, the walls of wealth, privilege, and social standing, were crumbling, leaving her exposed and vulnerable. In the days that followed, the Vance Empire began to unravel. News of Judith's machinations spread like wildfire through the social circles, ostracizing her from the elite she had so desperately sought to impress. Business partners distanced themselves, investors withdrew their funds, and the Vance name, once synonymous with success and prestige, became tainted with scandal. David, heartbroken and disillusioned, moved out of the mansion, seeking solace in a small apartment across town. He needed time, he said, to process everything, to rebuild his life, brick by painful brick. I understood. We both needed time, time to heal, to rediscover ourselves outside the shadow of Judith's toxic influence. Olivia, freed from Judith's financial grip, threw herself into her art, finding solace and strength in her creativity. Her paintings, once vibrant and full of life, now reflected the darkness she had endured, the pain of betrayal, but also the resilience of the human spirit. As for me, I found solace in my work, returning to my role as a social worker with a renewed sense of purpose. I channeled my grief, my anger, into helping others, guiding them through the treacherous landscapes of their own lives. I saw the echoes of my own struggle in their stories, the pain of betrayal, the fight for survival. Judith, isolated and disgraced, attempted to contact David, to plead for forgiveness, to rebuild the bridges she had so carelessly burned. But David refused to engage. He had finally broken free from her grasp, and he wasn't going back. The gilded cage that had once held me captive was now empty, its doors flung open, offering a path to freedom. I had lost much, a child, a husband, a sense of security, but I had also gained something invaluable, the truth. And in the end, the truth was more precious than any gilded cage. The months that followed were a slow, arduous process of healing and rebuilding. David and I began tentatively seeing each other again, the shared trauma of Judith's betrayal forging a new, more profound connection between us. Our conversations were hesitant at first, filled with silences and unspoken anxieties, but gradually we began to talk, to truly listen to each other, to understand the pain we had both endured. We talked about the future, about the possibility of children, the dream of a family, but this time, the conversation was different. It wasn't about fulfilling an obligation, a societal expectation, but about a genuine desire to build a life together. A life free from the shadow of Judith's manipulative influence. My work became my sanctuary, a place where I could channel my pain into purpose. I found a renewed sense of fulfillment in helping others navigate the complexities of their own lives, their struggles echoing my own journey of healing and resilience. I realized that the strength I had found within myself, the strength to confront Judith, to expose her lies, was a strength I could share with others. One rainy afternoon, I received a call from the nursing home where Judith now resided. She was asking for David. Her health was failing, they said, and she wanted to see him one last time. I relayed the message to David, my heart pounding in my chest. He was silent for a long moment, his face etched with a mixture of sadness and resignation. I'll go, he said finally, his voice quiet. Not for her, but for myself. I need to close this chapter of my life. He visited Judith the following day. I didn't ask him about the details of their conversation. Some wounds, I knew, were too deep to heal, some bridges too broken to rebuild. He returned that evening, a profound sense of peace settling over him. She didn't apologize, he said, his voice soft, but I didn't expect her to. I told her I forgave her, not for her sake, but for mine. I needed to let go of the anger, the resentment, to finally move on. Judith died a few weeks later, alone and forgotten. Her passing was a ripple in the vast ocean of life, barely noticed by the world she had so desperately sought to conquer. The Vance Empire, once a symbol of her ambition and ruthlessness, was dismantled, its assets liquidated, its legacy tarnished. Olivia, flourishing in her newfound freedom, 
held a successful exhibition of her artwork. Her paintings a testament to her resilience and her artistic vision. She dedicated the exhibition to me, a tribute to the sisterhood that had been tested but not broken. David and I, hand in hand, began to rebuild our lives. We moved out of the Vance mansion, the memories of Judith's toxic presence too heavy to bear. We found a small cottage by the sea, a place where we could breathe freely, where the air wasn't thick with expectation and unspoken resentments. One crisp autumn morning, I woke up with a familiar flutter in my stomach. I took a pregnancy test, my hands trembling as I waited for the result. Two lines. Positive. Tears welled up in my eyes. Tears of joy, of hope, of gratitude. This time it was different. This time, there was no fear, no anxiety, only the quiet anticipation of new life, a life free from the gilded cage. I told David the news that evening, watching as his face lit up with a joy that mirrored my own. We held each other close, the silence filled with unspoken promises, the weight of the past lifting, replaced by the lightness of hope. The gilded cage was gone, replaced by the vast, open sky. We were free, finally free to build our own future, a future filled with love, laughter, and the promise of a new beginning. The scars of the past remained, a reminder of the battles we had fought, the losses we had endured, but they were also a testament to our resilience, our strength, our unwavering belief in the power of love and forgiveness. And in the quiet moments, as I looked out at the endless expanse of the ocean, I knew that true freedom wasn't about escaping the cage, but about finding the strength to build your own wings.